Greetings in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to Moments with Truth, which is a television outreach of the five gospel halls here in Tobago. We sincerely pray that you will be blessed as you view today's program. We welcome you again to another session with Moments with Truth. And we continue to look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John. And today we are looking at him as the one who turns our water into wine. The story is found in chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, where we read that uh, the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the, mo the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother said unto the servants, Whatsoever he said unto you, do it. And they will set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed on him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother, and his brethren, his brothers, and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. Jesus turns our water into wine. Lord Jesus Christ is attending a wedding. We need to keep in mind who it is that attended this wedding in Cana of Galilee. He is no one else but the second person of the Trinity. He is God the Son. John tells us in chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 that he is God, the creator of the universe. John the Baptist tells us in chapter 1 verses 33 and 34 that he saw the Holy Spirit descending and remaining on Jesus. This was a sign given by the Father to John the Baptist concerning the Messiah. And that is why the Baptist says in verse 34 that he saw and bear record that Jesus is the Son of God. It is the Son of God who is at this wedding. Again, Nathaniel testifies in chapter 1 and verse 49, Rabbi, speaking to the Lord Jesus, says, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. So that this important wedding guest is not simply an earthly potentate like a British monarch 
or a United States or a Russian president is not merely a president or prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago. This is the one whom angels worship. You know, Isaiah says to us in his book, chapter 6, that he had a vision, a vision of angels called seraphim. Isaiah did not tell us how many angels he saw, but he tells us that each one of these creatures had six wings. And they used two of their wings to cover their faces, their face in the presence of the Son of God. Two of their wings they used to cover their feet in homage to this pre-incarnate God. And with the other two, they flew. And as they flew, Isaiah tells us that he heard them cry one to the other. Apparently not addressing the Son of God directly, but they cried to one another, and this is what they said. They were crying, holy, holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full with his glory. And John tells us that this one whom the angels worship, this one whom Isaiah beheld worshiping, is none else but the Son of God. So that it is this exalted Lord who came to us, this word who became flesh and pitched his tent among us. It is this exalted Lord Jesus who was at this wedding in Cana of Galilee. You know, except for the miracles, all the events that John bears testimony to, all these events are just normal events. It was just a normal day. You know, the first chapter of John ends with a conversation between the Lord Jesus and Nathaniel. Nathaniel says to the Lord, you are the son of God. And the Lord replies to Nathaniel saying in effect, I am the son of God, but I am also the son of man. God becomes a man and attends a wedding. Here is a regular, normal human event. A wedding that is held in Cana, the hometown of one of Jesus' disciples, according to chapter 21 and verse 2. Mary, the mother of Jesus, attends the wedding. And the Son of Man accepts an invitation to attend with his disciples. And after the wedding was over, Jesus, his mother, his brothers, and sisters, and his disciples went to another village. These events in the life of Christ are so ordinary. You know, it's an, it is an interesting observation that the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, who became the Son of Man, was able to live among men as any other man. He experienced hunger just as we do. He grew tired just as we grow tired. His disciples were always comfortable in his presence. As a matter of fact, at one time, they awoke a sleeping Jesus and asked him plainly during a storm, don't you care that we perish? They felt comfortable with him. Mothers felt comfortable bringing their children to Jesus. He received invitations to have dinner with both the respected Pharisees and the despised tax collector. We wonder what it was that a woman whom most religious folks would avoid 
saw in Jesus that gave her the confidence to approach the Lord Jesus and wash his feet with her tears and dry his feet with her hair. No wonder he was called Emmanuel. He really was God with us. He was invited to the wedding and he accepted the invitation. As the Lord Jesus Christ was at that wedding, the Bible tells us that the wine ran out at the wedding. The wine is a symbol of joy. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 104 and verse 15, it blesses God for wine that makes glad the heart of man and oil to make his face to shine and bread which strengthens man's heart. So he blesses God for wine that makes glad the heart of man. Wine is a symbol of joy. Now the Bible strongly condemns the excessive use of strong drink. The prophet Isaiah says in chapter 5 and verse 11, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. The wise man Solomon reminds us in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1 that wine is a mocker and that strong drink is raging and that he that is deceived by it is not wise. The Apostle Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that we should not be deceived because neither fornicators nor idolaters no adulterers, no effeminate, no abusers of themselves with mankind, no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So the Bible strongly condemns the excessive use of strong drink. Nevertheless, Wine is a symbol of joy in the Bible. You know, this running out of the wine tells us that joy runs out in the best life lived without God. The joy runs out in the best life lived without God. Someone said, Speaking to God, he says, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. The human heart would always be dissatisfied, restless, always looking for the next thing to fill it, and would always be unsuccessful because as this Augustine says, God made us for himself, and our heart would always be restless until it finds its rest in God. You know, I read of a young man who had tasted most of what the world has to offer, and he said to a Christian worker one time, my God, is this all there is to life? King Solomon had everything he needed to investigate the meaning of life. He had all the wisdom. The Bible tells us he's the wisest man that ever lived. God promised that there would never arise another man as wise as Solomon, except the Lord Jesus Christ. So he had all the wisdom. He had all the wealth. He's arguable arguably the richest man who ever lived. Solomon had access to all the human resources he would need to complete his investigation. His investigation concerning life, concerning the meaning of life. And his conclusion was that life lived only for what is under the sun is vain. 
This was Solomon's conclusion. That life lived for only what is under the sun, everything that this world has to offer, is vain. Listen to some of what he found by investigation. He said in verse 2 in chapter 1, Vanity of vanities, said Solomon. Vanity of vanities, he repeats. All is vanity. And in verse 8, chapter 1, he says, All things are full of labor. Man cannot enter into it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. Again, in verses 12 to 14 in chapter 1, the preacher was king, the preacher was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. He says, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun. And behold, he concludes, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Solomon did not only investigate, he also experimented. He pursued knowledge. Today we would say education. He went after silver and he went after gold. He enjoyed pleasure that comes from the enjoyment of music. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And I'd like us to please listen to Solomon's extensive report at the end of all his investigations and all his experiments. This is what Solomon says. This is what he concludes. He says, I made me great works. I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards, and I planted trees in them of all kind of fruits. I made me pools of water to water with them the forests that brought forth trees. I got me servants and maidens, and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me at Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked, he said, on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. This was con the conclusion of this wise man. He said, therefore, I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vex vexation of spirit. Chapter 2, verse 17. So try as we might, the wine of our life eventually runs out, just as what happened at this wedding in Cana of Galilee. The wine ran out. The joy of our lives will run out if we try to live our lives without God. You know, William Shakespeare has Macbeth saying, Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts 
and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. Life is a tale, Shakespeare says, told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That is how Shakespeare concluded life is. Life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. This is life lived under the sun. Life lived without God. So the wine ran out. Ran out, but the Lord Jesus Christ turned water into wine and the wedding guests are satisfied. Now sometimes the miracles of the Lord Jesus are described as wonders because of the effect they had on those who saw them. Matthew records a miracle in which the Lord Jesus multiplied seven loaves and a few little fishes to feed 4,000 4, men besides women and children. The incident is recorded in Matthew chapter 15. In telling the story, Matthew mentions a small detail that is a wonder to us. He says that this crowd was with the Lord Jesus for three days. Three days with Jesus. And although they were hungry and tired, they would not leave. There is something about the presence of Jesus that is totally delightful, totally sufficient. The way Christians describe our experience with our beloved Lord is that he, he saves, but he not only saves, he keeps. He not only saves and keeps, but he also satisfies. The Lord Jesus fills every lack. The Lord Jesus is enough. The psalmist looked to him for his satisfaction. He said in Psalm 16, Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. The songwriter puts it this way. Hallelujah, my soul is satisfied. My soul is satisfied. He took me from the bottom of hell and made me feel at home. He came to me one morning and set my spirit free. Hallelujah, my soul is satisfied. Now the wine that the Lord Jesus Christ provided was sufficient. It was more than enough. Estimate, estimates go as high as 180 gallons of wine. When he fed the 5,000 men beside women and children, 12 baskets full of bread and fish remained after all ate and were filled. When he fed the 4,000 men besides women and children, seven baskets full of bread and fish remained after all ate and were filled. So the Lord Jesus Christ provides what is sufficient. What he provides is more than enough. And the wine that the Lord Jesus Christ provided was not only sufficient, but the wine that he provided was satisfying. It was the very best. So we read that the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But you, he said, have kept the good wine until now. The Lord Jesus provided not only sufficient wine, but he provided satisfying wine. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became the Son of Man, did so in order to provide for you and me the best life we could ever dream to have. 
The Lord Jesus Christ provided the best life that we could ever dream to have. Shakespeare again says that life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Solomon said that life lived without God is vain. He concluded that he hated life because as he looked at life, with all his wisdom and his wealth and all his resources, as he investigated life, as he experimented with life and enjoyed all the pleasures that this life could give, Solomon decided that is nothing but vanity. But the life that the Lord Jesus Christ gives satisfies. He said, this is life eternal. This is real life. This is, this is satisfying life. This is life that's lived to the full with great satisfaction and contentment that you may know God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So that the Son of God has become the Son of Man in order to, prov to provide for you and for me the kind of life that God wants us to live. God wants us to live a satisfying life and that is why the Lord Jesus Christ could call unto us and say, Come unto me, all you that have labored and, I, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is life. John says in verse 11, that at the end of the miracle, the disciples believed on him. Will you believe? We trust that as you consider the, this miracle of the Lord Jesus, that you'll believe on him, trust him, and you'll find the satisfaction that you're looking for. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again for sending the Lord Jesus Christ into the world to be our savior and to satisfy our souls. We ask, O oh God, that the joy of the Lord the joy which the only the Lord could provide would be our experience, that we we'll trust Christ as our Savior, receive him, and find the joy that we seek. We pray these things for Christ Jesus' sake. Thank you for viewing today's program. We invite you to contact us at any of the media advertised or visit us at any of the meetings that appear on the screen. Dear friends, remember that Jesus saves, he keeps, and he satisfies. May God bless you.